9 tonight, please. Nehemiah 9 this evening, if you would. Turn over there. Nehemiah chapter 9. And let's pray one more time and we'll get dive into the scripture tonight. Lord, we thank you for the word of God. And I thank you, Lord, that we can go through it verse by verse here in, uh, we've done now Ezra and, and uh, getting through Nehemiah. And we thank you for what you've taught us. I pray you'd help us to understand this Old Testament time and era and culture, Lord, of when what is being said and, and how they are viewing it, Lord. I pray that we'd make great application for our New Testament day. And Lord, I pray that, God, you would teach us and help us, Holy Spirit, and that you would uh, work through me, Lord, and, and help all of us as we uh, look at the Word of God and as we learn. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. If you remember from last week, Nehemiah 8 and Nehemiah 9, uh, there's, no, there's no time between them. It just keeps going right in. Uh, Nehemiah 8, remember, they started to... Uh, read the Word of God. Ezra stood up on his pulpit of wood and began to read the Word of God. And they began to understand what they were doing that they shouldn't be and what they were not doing that they should be doing. And they began to have great revival in the fact that they pleaded for it and they were coming back again and more and more for it. We found out that uh, uh, they learned that the Feast of the Tabernacles was something they were supposed to be doing. And they weren't doing it in that seventh month and, uh, and literally uh, making like a camp meeting, making little uh, huts to uh, dwell in for a week uh, as they remembered when God brought them out of Egypt and dwelt in the wilderness. And so in Nehemiah 9, as we started last week, let's just look at the first few verses here again. The Bible says, now in the 20 and fourth day of this month, that's the seventh month that we talked about in chapter 8. The children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloths and earth upon them. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. We talked about that again last week, how it's good to acknowledge and pray as a whole and take responsibility for our country. They were taking responsibility for their fathers and the sins of their fathers. And they were acknowledging it. They, were under, they didn't try to delete history or, or change the history books. They were acknowledging the sins of the past. And they were confessing them so that they could do better as they move forward. Okay, we see that here. Verse 3. And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord... Their God, one fourth part of the day and another fourth part, they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. As you were, if you skip down here, we have the Levites that began to lead verse four and five in praising God and in and worshiping the Lord together. And as this chapter go, continues to go on, they begin to go through the history of Israel and praising the Lord from where they had come from. If you remember, we, uh, we've left off in verse 12 talking about the cloudy pillar and the pillar of fire. We left off there. Let's pick up in verse 13. Again, they're going through their history as they're worshiping the Lord and they're saying, God, you've been so great to us. Let me remember what God has done for us. Shenandoah, I believe as Americans, we ought to do that. But also, also as Shenandoah Bible Baptist Church and look back at the great victories God has done here and rejoice and praise Him for it. Amen. And so as we continue here tonight, verse 13, as the Bible says, Thou camest down also upon Mount Sinai and spake us with them from heaven and gave us them right judgments and true laws and good statutes and commandments. I want you to consider there for a moment. Oftentimes we think about Moses being up on top of the mount and receiving the law of God. But if you go back and read Gen uh, uh, Exodus 17 and 18 and 19 and then 20 when he's given the law and all that, the Bible doesn't say that God just gave it to Moses. He actually says the people were encircled around the mount. And the Bible says that the people heard God speak from the top of the mount and they watched the mount shake as he was on it. 
It's a very fascinating. The people heard the voice of God giving the law. So it wasn't just that they had to put their trust in Moses who received it. They heard it. And then God wrote it on the tablets and he brought it down to them. And so very fascinating there. It says uh, here that they, he spake us with them from heaven in verse 13. Look at verse 14. And made us known unto them by thy holy Sabbath and commandest them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses thy servant. And gave us them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought us forth water for them out of the rock for their thirst and promised them that they should go in to possess the land which thou hast sworn to give them. Now, that fascinates me when I think about that. I want you to consider the mercy of God. Here they are in the wilderness, and yet they're in the wilderness because of their own stubborn will. Are they not? Did they not say to, to, to Joshua and to Caleb and to, and to Moses, we don't want to go into this land, there's giants in there. Oh, that we could return to Egypt, remember that? I mean, the place of slavery. And yet, in their stubborn will of saying no to the will of God, yet he provides them with food. Wow. The provision of God when we try to do things our own way. Well, in that, the mercy of God right there. I, maybe some of you can't relate, but I sure can because I've had my time of my stubborn will doing things my way and yet how God saw fit to bring me through that to this point now. Praise God for it. Amen? Praise God for His mercy and His grace toward, towards us. It says here, it brought us, in verse 15, brought us forth water from them out of the rock. How many times did He do that? Twice. The first time Moses was to strike the rock and the water came out. And the second time he was supposed to do what? He was supposed to speak to the rock. It was a picture of Jesus Christ. Jesus only had to be crucified one time when the rock was struck. The second time all we have to do is call unto him and he would give us that water. Amen? Like, like uh, John chapter 4 talks about that water that will, will, uh, they'll never thirst again. All you had to do was call out. It was a picture of Jesus. And yet Moses, because of the people and his frustration with them, he struck it twice. And yet, did God give him water? He did. The mercy of God is unbelievable sometimes. As we think, how long would, would we be alive if, if, we weren't, uh, if, if we were God and we were dealing with us? How long would we still be? I mean, would we put up with us? Probably not. All right. We, that's just how we are. Praise the Lord for his long suffering. Amen. Verse 16. But they, they and our fathers dealt, dealt proudly and hardened their necks and hearkened not to thy commandments. What does that mean when we harden our neck? If you, if you think about it, I'm just going to read you one verse. Proverbs 29, 1. The Bible says, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Harden your neck. Brother Gaylor, Mrs. Gaylor, when you, you have horses, and how do you lead a horse? You put a, something in their mouth, don't you? A bit, right? Because if you, what happens when you turn their head? You turn the horse's head, and then the neck turns, and then the body follows it, doesn't it? And then how you, and the Bible talk about in James how a little bit turns a, I think it talks about the rudder on a massive ship and the bit in a horse's mouth and being able to lead them on. But what happens, is, is a horse a very powerful and muscle kind of an animal? It is very powerful, isn't it? You could, uh, you think Brother Gaylor could overtake a horse if that horse was being stubborn? I don't think so. Okay, because a horse is just solid muscle. And what happens when you have that bit in his mouth and you're pulling on that bit, but he just stands there and does this? He ain't going nowhere. And you ain't making him go anywhere, is it? Right, because he's hardening his neck, and that's the picture here. And we, in our stubborn will, can do the same thing oftentimes. Notice verse number 17. And refused to obey, neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didst among them, but hardened their necks and in their rebellion appointed a captain to return to their bondage. Wow. Now, when I look up 
the scripture in Numbers chapter 14. This is just after they have rejected the promised land. Remember the, the, the spies went in the promised land. They come out, they're whining and, and saying a, an evil report. They've rejected it. And the Bible says they did appoint, uh, they wanted to appoint a captain, but it does not specify who. Here it makes it sound like they actually picked out a man to do it, to lead them. It doesn't tell us who that would be. Again, wow, in our arrogance sometimes, and God is just, look what it says. But thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and forsookest them not. Lamentations chapter 3, consider that, right? Where it says, great is thy faithfulness. Why? It is because of the Lord's mercies that we are not what? Consumed. And we're not burnt up. Just a fireball from heaven and we're gone. It's because of his mercy. If we haven't thanked the Lord today for his mercy, we ought to. Brother Jay, because, man, we're just a bunch of knuckleheads and we're stubborn. Amen. We like our way. We do our thing. I can't be the only one in here. Come on, guys. We know what we're talking about there. And this is the way it's going to be. Bless God. We don't even think about it. Lord, what do you want? And yet, his long-suffering, his mercy, his patience with us. Look at verse 18. Yea, when they had made them a molten calf and said, This is thy God that brought thee up out of Egypt and had wrought great provocations Watch this now. Yet thou in thy manifold mercies forsookest them not in the wilderness. You know, it's humbling to think that how merciful God is when we have been so arrogant in our sin. We, we get awfully fired up about other people and their arrogance, don't we? <laughs> we do. We get a little fired up. I can't believe this person is sitting here defying that authority in front of them and digging their heels in and we want to grab a hold of them and yet we do that to God sometimes don't we wow mercy mercy praise the Lord says here forsook us them not in the wilderness the pillar of the cloud departed not from them by day to lead them in the way neither the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way wherein they should go thou gavest also watch us now thy good spirit To instruct them. And withheld us not thy manna from their mouth. And gave us them water for their thirst. Thy good spirit. You know the Holy Spirit of God is not oftentimes mentioned. He's not even. He's not. We don't think about him as much in the Old Testament. As we do in the New Testament. Because he's not mentioned as much. Yet he is mentioned in the Psalms. He is mentioned here. We know that. Is it first or second. I think it's first Peter says. That the holy men of God were moved by the Spirit when they wrote the Scriptures. The Holy Spirit of God is the reason why we have the Scriptures. He penned it down and He gave it to these men who penned it down. And uh, we, we don't often think about that Holy Spirit, His Spirit. And it says here, He gave it to them to instruct them. Amen. Look at verse 21. Yea, forty years didst thou sustain them in the wilderness... So that they lacked nothing. Their clothes waxed not old and their feet swelled not. How would you all like to wear the same clothes for 40 years? No? Nobody's into that? Right? But the Bible says, the Bible says here that they did, what's it say here? And they lacked nothing and their clothes waxed not old and their feet swelled not. Some of you all, some of you guys have your favorite t-shirt from like times going by. Probably you do. Anyways, uh, my wife's like, can we retire this thing yet? I'm like, it's still good. It's only got three holes in it. <laughs> still good. I mean, someday I'll wax the car with it, but not yet. Not yet. Okay. Um, but it says here for 40 years, their clothes got not old. Now it says their feet swelled not. When I looked up that word swelled, obviously we can think about Uh, retaining water and swelling and different things like that. But this word swelled in the Hebrew literally means to blister. So their feet didn't blister all that time walking in the wilderness with the same shoes and the same clothes. 
And uh, it says uh, in Deuteronomy 29, you could look up there, verse 5, it says that, they, that their shoes, they didn't get old and they didn't wear out. And praise the Lord for that. See these, these blessings of God. Sometimes we, we think about it and, and new Christians, well, well is God, is God going to reward Christians for their, for their faithfulness and tithing and all this? Is he going to give them money back? They're going to be rich? No, they got, he never promises that once, but he does promise blessings. And sometimes blessings is a car not breaking down. Sometimes it, it, sometimes it is allowing a flat tire at a specific point to avoid an accident or to avoid the highway. And maybe it's a little side road or maybe it's a parking lot instead of the highway. There's so many blessings of God that we often forget about, isn't there not? So many. How many times have we opened our eyes to something later and said, wow. If I had only been five seconds earlier, that could have been me. You think God's not involved in that? Sure He is. Sure He is. And uh, the Lord the Lord takes care of us. Look at verse 22. Moreover, thou gavest them kingdoms and nations, and didst divide them into corners. So they possessed the land of Sihon, and the land of the, of the king of Heshbon, and the land of Og, king of Bashan, Bashan those are the lands that would be east of the Jordan River. Remember the two and a half tribes that wanted to settle east of the river? They said this is good for cattle. Uh, Bashan or Bashan, that was good, uh, a, a good place for cattle. It's mentioned many times in Scripture. And here he gave them those lands. When it says he divided them into corners, it literally means he parted out the land for them and gave them different sections of it. That's what he's talking about there. Verse 23. Their children also multipliest thou as the stars of heaven, and broughtest them into the land concerning which thou hast promised to their fathers, that they should go in to possess it. So the children went in and possessed the land, and thou subduest before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and gavest them into their hands and their kings and the people of their land, that they might do with them as they would." When it says Canaanites there, sometimes, sometimes it refers to Canaanites as everybody in the land, the land of Canaan. And sometimes it refers to a specific group of people. Because if you look at different passages, when it says they went in, they took care of the Jebusites and the Hittites and the Canaanites and the, Babel, uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Martin, Martinsburgites and the, and the Falling Waterites. And the shepherd townsites and you know all them, right? And it says them all. The Canaanites are one of those groups of people. But sometimes he groups all of them in to say just Canaanites. He does that with Israel. You ever read along and say, why is he talking about Ephraim so much? Ephraim was a tribe of Israel. But oftentimes he interchanges Israel with Ephraim. If you've ever studied and seen that. Because Ephraim was a, was a tribe that chose to do wrong quite often. And, and, he, and he, he pointed at Israel as being after this tribe that had done that. And uh, he, he, mixes, he uh, uses both Israel and Ephraim sometimes when speaking of all the northern kingdom of Ephraim, uh, of Israel, by using that name. Let's continue here. Verse 25. And they took strong cities in a fat land. And possessed houses full of all goods, wells digged, vineyards and olive yards and, and fruit trees in abundance. So they did eat and were filled and became fat and delighted themselves in thy great goodness. Everybody read that? They became fat and it was a good thing. So once you see that, some of you all, you don't like being fat. I'm telling you, it's a good thing. It says right there. Okay, once you see that. It says they came into a fat land and, and they got fat. And it says it delighted themselves in thy great goodness. So once you see that. Hey, is that not Bible? I'm, just, I'm having fun with you tonight. All right. I should, I should stop before somebody takes me seriously. All right. Hey, um, amen. Praise the Lord. Fat land. Why would he call it a fat land? Well, oftentimes it's described as a, a land that is very plentiful. Plenty, plenteous. It, uh, he talked about it as being milk, where milk and honey is, and, and uh, they would have everything they needed, and it would be plenteous. That's why he's considering it a fat land. Verse 26, Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against thee, 
and cast thy law behind their backs, and slew thy prophets, which testified against them to turn them to thee. And they wrought great provocations. Now, when did they slew, when did they slay prophets? When did they do that? Actually, Jesus references this, references it twice in the New Testament. How under Ahab and Jezebel, prophets were slain. They were. Not just the 400 prophets of Baal that Elijah was slain, but other good prophets were. There were many more prophets than we have written in the Word of God. There was many more than, than uh, what we have the books of the, of the Old Testament and the minor prophets and the, and the major prophets and all of that. that. In Elijah's day, there was actually a school of prophets where there was men being trained to be the prophets of their day. It doesn't talk about it much, but it does mention it. And there was many prophets. God would not leave his people without uh, a prophet to declare the words and the will of God until, until that which was in part would be made whole. And that's the word of God. As 1 Corinthians 13 tells us about. Praise the Lord for a full... Aren't you, we take it for granted, don't we? The fact that we have a Bible and it's complete and it's whole and it's a gift of God and we don't need to, to, to wonder about a, a prophet wandering around in the country and what he's got to tell us and, and uh, all of this. We have it. I, I've held it. I've read it. I, I, I've, uh, I've studied it today. Isn't it amazing that we have that? We take it for granted so often, do we not? I mean, the truth is, this is the first time I've thought about that today. I've taken it for granted today. And yet what a blessing it is. Praise the Lord for it. Look at verse 27. Therefore thou, deliver, thou deliveredst them into the hand of their enemies who vexed them. And in the time of their trouble, when they cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven. And according to thy manifold mercies, thou gavest them saviors who saved them out of the hand of their enemies. Who do you suppose he's talking about when he says saviors, plural? Again, read the context. Thou gavest them saviors who saved them out of the hand of their enemies. Anybody? Samson. Samson who, and Samson was a? He was a judge. That's right. There was uh, many judges in the book of Judges that would deliver them out of the hands of, of the enemies. In fact, that word for saviors there, it, it's not meant to uh, portray the Lord Jesus Christ or anything like that. That word was chosen, but it, it, that same Hebrew word is used in the book of Judges when it calls them deliverers. That word means a deliverer, a to deliver. And so to free, to succor, or to deliver. And uh, it's used, uh, again, here it was translated saviors. In Judges, it was translated deliverers. So we see that. Let's continue. Verse 28, please. But after they had rest, they did evil again before thee. Therefore leftest thou them in the hand of their enemies, so that... They had the dominion over them. Yet when they returned and cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven, and many times didst thou deliver them according to thy mercies. Wow. That's a thought. Now, we're thinking, we're talking about Israel here. We're talking Old Testament. After the days of Joshua, there was no king and every, the Bible says every man did that which was right in his own eyes. But that doesn't mean that every man was right. He did that which was right in his own eyes. And so when they went against the law that they had been given, God said, okay, my hand of blessing comes off because you've been disobedient. And that's when an enemy came in and took them over. But all they had to do was cry back to God and he would send them a deliverer. Now consider that today. When we have distanced ourselves from God, he says, I'll forgive you if you just ask. 1 John 1, 9, yes. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Praise God for that. Cleans us, amen. 
And this is not anything you don't know, but we need the reminder of it. That's the purpose of this chapter. They're literally going through their history, being reminded of where God brought them victory after victory after victory, even in their wickedness. And he would deliver them. And it's a great time to, to go back and remember as we worship God. That's exactly what we do when we come to the communion table. This do in remembrance of me. We go back and we remember the, the, the deliverance that God brought us when he died on the cross. Amen? Amen. Amen. Look please, if you would, 29. And testifies against them that thou mightest bring them again unto thy law. Yet they dealt proudly and hearkened not unto thy commandments, but sinned against thy judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. And withdrew the shoulder and hardeneth their neck and would not hear. What if, what if somebody was on their way to do something that was going to hurt them? And you, like a child, maybe a teenager that you have, and they're about to do something that's going to hurt them, and you put your hand upon their shoulder, and they withdraw their shoulder. They pull it away. A cold shoulder. How disrespectful that would be. That's what God's saying right here. That's exactly what His people did. They withdrew the shoulder and they hardened their neck and would not hear. Verse 30, Yet many years didst thou forbear them and testified against them by thy spirit in thy prophets. Yet would they not give ear, therefore gavest thou them into the hand of the people of the lands. Nevertheless, for thy great mercy sake, thou didst not utterly consume them nor forsake them, for thou art a gracious and merciful God. Amen. Now therefore, our God the great, the mighty, and the terrible God, who keep His covenant and mercy, let not all the trouble seem little before thee, that 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 hath come upon us, on our kings, on our princes, on our priests, on our prophets, and on our fathers, and on all thy people, since the time of the kings of Assyria unto this day. Remember, Assyria was the country to the north, the country that would come down and take over Israel, the ten northern tribes, and would haul them off into captivity and disperse them that they wouldn't be heard from again. He's, re- he's relating back to those times in Second Kings when they oppressed Israel and then they would later take care of them. Look at verse 33, how be it thou art just in all that is brought upon us, for thou hast done Wicked, thou hast done right, but we have done wickedly. Right there, that's step number one, recognizing what we've done, right? Recognizing who we are before a holy God. We do well. We do well to, as we come to prayer and and reminding ourselves in prayer and thanking the Lord for the fact that He's holy and that He does right. And in prayer, we remind ourselves. Who we are before Almighty God and before a holy God. As Isaiah laid flat on his face before God, that vision, Isaiah chapter 6. He said, I'm not worthy to be here. I'm a nobody. And God says, yes, but who who am I going to send? He says, Lord, if you use me, I'm here. If you use me, I'm here. I'm a nobody. I don't deserve this, but I'll go if you want me to go. That was Isaiah chapter 6. Look at it verse now, verse 33. Excuse me, we've already read that. Verse 34. Neither have our kings, our princes, our priests, nor our fathers kept thy law, nor hearkened unto thy commandments and thy testimonies, wherewith thou didst testify against them. For they have not served thee in their kingdom, and in thy great goodness that thou gavest them, and in the large and fat land which thou gavest before them, neither turned they from their wicked works. Behold, We are servants this day and for the land that thou gavest unto our fathers to eat the fruit thereof and the good thereof. Behold, we are servants in it. And it yielded much increase unto the kings whom thou hast set over us because of our sins. Also, they have dominion over our bodies and over our cattle at their pleasure pleasure, and we are in great distress. 
And because of all this, we make a sure covenant and write it. And our princes, Levites, and priests seal unto it. All right, we're going to talk about that last verse in just a moment. But consider what's going on here. They have worshipped the Lord. They have been reminding themselves of their history and all that God has done with them and for them. And they've had great revival now, confessing their sin, worshiping the Lord, having a time of remembrance. And then verse 38 says, we make a sure covenant. They're literally going to write down the fact, they're going to they're write down and say, we are going to serve God. Like Joshua, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. Right? That's what they're doing at this point. Hey, we've seen the word of God. We're trying to get right with God. We've worshiped God. Now we're going to make a covenant. We're going to make a document that says we're going to hold true to the to things of God. Almost like a church covenant. A group of people come together and they make a church covenant. They make a, they make a, uh, a constitution, if you will, and says we hold to these truths, that being of the Bible, and this is what we believe according to Scripture. And they seal it down. In the Eastern cultures, back in this day, a, a, a document was authenticated by seals of those in authority. So here you have the Levites and the priests that are literally going to put their stamp of approval upon this covenant. And when you get into chapter 10, you'll see all these names. And um, you'll want to be here for that night because you've got to hear me pronounce all those. <clears throat> you know, H and P and S and R and H and M, you know, all those, right? Okay, but listen, it's literally going to write down the names of these men that seal the covenant, that are willing to stand behind what they say they believe and that they won't turn from God. Wow, willing to stand. I praise God when I think back of our history, of all the men that signed their name on the Declaration of Independence. Wow. Wow. And each one of those men were risking their lives and their families and, their, and anything that they had in possession because they were writing a letter to a tyrant who was the king, really the power of the world across the sea. And they wrote their name down. Remember John Hancock. Remember he, he wrote his name, right? Remember? And, and he says, see if, Prince, see if the, uh, uh, the, or excuse me, the king can read this. And he wrote it real big. Remember that? It was the idea was without his spectacles, that he could, that he could read it without his spectacles. You say, why are you getting off on history? Because I get excited about it. Here we had some great men that stood and said, we declare ourselves to be free and independent of England and, and the king. Amen. And I'm glad they did. Because we have a great country. Now, it's not always been up, you know, wonderful and, and right according to God, but we've got a great country that's created and, and principled on wonderful things like the Word of God. Amen. And people don't want to believe that anymore, but they haven't walked around the monuments in Washington. They haven't looked at our founding documents when they say that because they don't know their history. Amen. And here in chapter 10, you're going to see these men that were willing to put their name on the seal that says, I stand here and we won't change from it. Praise God for that. I'm thankful many, many years ago when Shenandoah Bible Baptist Church was formed that somebody had to stand and say, we unite and this is what we believe. Amen. Praise God for that. Great foundation and amen and amen. And thank you all for uh, staying by the right stuff and sticking with the word of God. Amen. It's not always easy, but it's right. Amen. And God never said, we just do what's easy. He said, do what's right and be holy. Amen. Amen and amen. And um, I'm preaching to the choir now. You all know it. Amen. I appreciate your faithful core here on Wednesday nights. And uh, wouldn't you know it, celebrate and worship the Lord because we got through another chapter. Amen. So there you go. Uh, um, how many chapters in here? I think 14, if I'm not mistaken. So we've gotten through nine of them. Amen. Remember when I said uh, it took Nehemiah 52 days to build the wall. It'll take Pastor John 52 weeks to get through Nehemiah. Amen. So amen to that. Hallelujah. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for just being such a great God. Thank you, Lord, for tonight. 
And uh, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for these wonderful folks who have had to listen to a raspy voice preacher, but yet the truth of the word of God came through. Thank you for the history of Israel and what we've learned from it. Thank you for the fellowship and the prayer time tonight. And Lord, would you just bless us as we leave and may we be faithful and willing to stand by, on the word of God and what it says and what we believe. Thank you for a great church that holds true to it. I pray for our country tonight, the United States of America, that we would wake up and we would return to our foundations. God, help us, please. I don't believe that there is no hope for our country. Some people say that, oh, we're we going to see a revival again. Lord, where the word of God is, where your people, where your spirit is, I believe there still can be revival. And I pray for that. Thank you for it. And I love you. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, I love you.